tonight clashes on land in a protest over business at sea. Scary moments in St. John's. Punching horses and assaulting individuals, that's unacceptable. And the calls for a freer fishing industry. Your dictatorship at the moment. Threatening a government takedown over the carbon tax. Will he spike the hike or will we have a carbon tax election? He scores! Chris Simon on the one-timer! Also, the family of Chris Simon says he suffered from being an NHL enforcer. Chris Simon should get credit for this one! Plus, accusations of an information breach over royal medical records. She's absolutely entitled to a degree of privacy. And the pursuit of happiness. Tell the world that you're happy. Come on, buddy. Canada takes a hit on a global measurement of joy. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with the dramatic confrontation between police and protesters on the doorsteps of Newfoundland and Labrador's legislature. The chaotic clash between fish harvesters and mounted police even delayed the release of the province's budget. Harvesters are demanding more freedom over who they can sell their catch to and for how much and want the province to loosen restrictions on what they are calling a cartel. CTV's Garrett Berry leads us off tonight on the tensions. Protesters clashed with two mounted police units as they blocked access to the provincial legislature this morning. After the encounter, one man was brought away in an ambulance with what organizers called a broken hip. An officer was also injured during what police call a rush. Demonstrators were here since dawn. They want changes to how Newfoundland and Labrador's fishery is regulated. They say the market here is like a cartel. They can only sell to certain buyers at prices that are sometimes set by a government-appointed board. Your dictatorship at the moment. Um, I park my boat, it don't matter what the weather's like, I'm told when to go, what to bring in, and, and how much I get paid for it. We need more competition. They protested all morning with one loud argument between a demonstrator and a senior member of the Premier's own staff. Well, you got no respect for us here now by trying to get into our picket line. Around noon, after the province said it would delay today's planned budget speech, protesters declared victory and said they'd be back. Something happened today that have never happened before in the history of Newfoundland. The budget was canceled. Yeah! And I got a funny feeling that it may be canceled again tomorrow. But the provincial government went to court and got an injunction against these protests, giving police more power to disrupt them. Premier Andrew Fury called today's scenes violent. Some of the videos that I've seen, punching horses and assaulting individuals, that, that's unacceptable. And uh, the police uh, had a job to do, and uh, they will continue to do it. He said he is listening to the fisheries union in the province and committing to making some changes. He also said his budget will be delivered no matter what. The focus will return to this legislature tomorrow to see if the provincial government here can introduce their budget or whether demonstrators will shut it down once again. Omar? All right, Garrett, thank you. In Saskatchewan, the provincial government did release its budget despite angry protests from teachers in front of the legislature there. It feels like as a teacher we don't necessarily get the supports that our students need and we need in the classroom. Despite an increase in education funding, the Teachers Federation says it's not enough to restore the per student spend from nearly a decade ago. Some teachers are planning another strike on Friday. There was also intensified political acrimony in Ottawa today. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev turned up the heat on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau over the government's carbon price increase on April 1st. And now he's planning a non-confidence motion. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver on the threat and whether it will have any impact. High in the polls, the Conservatives are now turning to a new tactic to try and force an election on the Liberals over the controversial carbon tax. An election on the price on pollution? We had three, Mr. Speaker, and we won them all. <laughs> then he shouldn't be afraid to have one more. 
Speaking to caucus today, the Conservative leader put the government on notice, saying he intends to move a non-confidence motion tomorrow if the government doesn't scrap the $15 a tonne carbon tax increase planned for April 1st. Right now, the Conservatives have a massive advantage over the Liberals. They're at 39 percent. The Liberals are at 25. So for the Conservatives to have an election now would probably be very good news. And they're trying to put pressure and up the ante on the carbon tax, which is a key dividing line between the two parties. Polls show Canadians are divided on the carbon tax, and so are provincial leaders. Ontario Liberal leader Bonnie Crombie and New Brunswick Liberal leader Susan Holt want the hike scrapped. While the premiers of Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Alberta, Ontario and Nova Scotia either want the carbon tax cancelled or the hike paused. So at this time when the cost of living, the pressures that families are under, the pressures Nova Scotians are under for, for, the, for the federal government to be reaching into the pocket and taking even more, it's just, it's not appropriate in any way. While an election now may be advantageous for the Conservatives, the Liberals are unlikely to lose any non-confidence vote. The NDP are on side with the carbon tax, and so why why vote against it? B, um, they've got these other things in the can with the Liberals, like Pharmacare, for example, and they're not going to jeopardize that, I don't think. The Liberals say this increase is necessary to drive down emissions, and that many Canadians will get more money back from the Canada carbon rebate. But the Conservatives disagree and say that this hike, Omar, will only make life more expensive. All right, Annie, thank you. To the deepening cracks in the Liberal caucus now after the watered-down NDP motion on Palestinian statehood passed on Monday. One of the most outspoken critics of the motion and one of the three Liberals who voted against it says he has not ruled out crossing the floor to join the opposition Conservatives. I have relationships, and, and, and in the same way my Liberal colleagues are talking to me, um, others are talking to me. Today, the immigration minister said the motion could make it harder for people seeking asylum in Canada to get out of Gaza. But actions of the government of Canada has consequences. And on the particular impact of that program, I don't think that motion is necessarily a good thing. While Mark Miller says the motion was principled, he added it has upset Israel's government. More Canadians had a chance to say their goodbyes on the final day of former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney's lying in state in Ottawa. It was a privilege, actually, to work for him. I wouldn't do this for every politician, but for Brian Mulroney, for sure. He was just a great man. His family attended the public viewing again today, meeting many well-wishers. The cortege will now travel to Montreal for a two-day lying in repose starting tomorrow morning. Mulroney would have turned 85 years old today. And we will be broadcasting live from Montreal this Friday and again on Saturday for our special coverage of the state funeral for Brian Mulroney starting at 9 a.m. on CTV and online at ctvnews.ca. The federal government revealed today it has called the Mounties to look into several cases of fraud involving millions of illegitimate payments on federal contracts. Ottawa says they're not related to the controversial Arrive Can app, but have warned they could discover even more. CTV's Michael Couture has the details. Accusations of fraud have led the government to ask the RCMP to investigate IT contractors who worked on federal contracts and allegedly double-billed. An internal review found between 2018 and 2022, three individual IT subcontractors charged the same hours to multiple government departments. The alleged fraud netted the trio $5 million and touched 36 different government departments and agencies. This is a, obviously a troubling outcome, something that we would never want to see. The government officials told reporters between five and ten other internal investigations are underway, suspecting similar schemes. Opposition conservatives believe it's a troubling trend. And frankly, um, you know, they, they need to name names. We, we don't know who has uh, been implicated in this. Now, these latest cases aren't connected to the Arrive Can app, but they do come just weeks after the Auditor General's report revealed a lack of checks and balances in the government's accounting. However, the whistleblowers who raised concerns around Arrive Can say the procurement process is vulnerable. The way that the, these contracts have, have been um, designed, um, it allows um, bad actors to abuse them in ways that are um, discoverable. 
Now, to better manage subcontracting, the government is setting up a new integrity and compliance office and is asking all managers to take a closer look at third-party contracting. Before issuing payment, they will need to monitor and document the delivery of services. The procurement minister says modernizing the process could catch would-be fraudsters. Just a few years ago, cross-referencing contracts wasn't possible because they were siloed within departments and were often only on paper. Omar? All right, Mike. Michael Couture in Ottawa tonight. An unusual sight on a highway in southwestern Ontario today. A Canadian Forces armored personnel carrier lost control and flipped onto its side on the 401 running through Oshawa, Ontario. Crews eventually got the vehicle back up and there were no injuries reported. The Biden administration revealed the strictest rules yet in the U.S. for gas car emissions. The goal, to push the accelerator on more climate-friendly vehicles. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency says its new pollution standards will transform the U.S. auto industry and cut billions of tons of carbon emissions over the next three decades. By 2032, the White House wants more than half of all new vehicle sales in the U.S. to be electric. Three years later, in 2035, Canada wants all sales of its cars, SUVs, crossovers and light trucks to be climate friendly. Investigators are trying to determine the cause of a huge pre-dawn explosion that destroyed a house in central Utah. A home security camera caught the moment the duplex blew up. Two women were inside at the time, one in each unit. One escaped with minor injuries. The other did not survive. And a beloved clubhouse at a senior's community in a Philadelphia suburb was destroyed after a fast-moving fire destroyed the recreation center. Fortunately, no one was injured. The hockey world is grieving the sudden loss of former NHLer Chris Simon. Tonight, his hockey family stood by his side as they paid tribute to the enforcer. Our entire organization extends our deepest condolences to his family and his friends. Now, please join us in a moment of silence as we come together to remember and honor the life and legacy of Chris Simon. Chris Simon was honored right before the Toronto Maple Leafs and Washington Capitals game tonight. His family says the 52-year-old died by suicide and believe repeated traumatic brain injuries played a major part. Here's CTV's Adrian Gobriel. They score! Chris Simon should get credit for this one. Chris Simon's hockey journey is one that's all too familiar. Chris Simon on the one-timer. Born in a small town, he achieved his NHL dream as a fierce competitor he became a Stanley Cup champion, only to have his life cut tragically short. On Monday night, Simon was pronounced dead. A statement released today through his former agent reads, the family of Chris Simon regretfully announces that Chris died by suicide, going on to share that the family strongly believes and witnessed firsthand that Chris struggled immensely from CTE, which unfortunately resulted in his death. How many people have to die? before somebody thinks it's important enough to, you know, stop it. Dr. Carmela Tartaglia has studied the donated brains of deceased athletes. She believes it's completely plausible that Simon suffered from CTE. It's really important to understand that a concussion can lead to significant neuropsychiatric symptoms, and those can set you up for suicide. Years of research has uncovered that repeated head injuries can lead to the progressive degenerative disease known as CTE. Nearly every professional sports league has acknowledged that relationship as a medical fact. Everyone except the National Hockey League. Chris's passing is tragic. It's sad. NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman avoided linking Simon's passing to CTE when asked about the family's claim today. On all of these matters, we wait to see what the medical experts tell us. To not acknowledge that there's a relationship, to me, seems irresponsible. Some former NHL players say it's time for the league to quote, man up. Once a guy dies, they'll say how tragic this is, yet they won't advocate. The NHL is the last living league to say no, there isn't a plausible cause. They're taking a page right out of Big Tobacco, 
with smoking and lung cancer. Currently, CTE can only be diagnosed once a person has died, though doctors believe so much more can be done to support athletes before it's too late. Chris Simon was more than just a hockey player. He was also a son, a brother, and a father of four. He was 52 years old. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up. And it shows that something has gone very, very wrong here. The alleged breach of Kate Middleton's medical files. Plus, no laughing matter. Canada's happiness score slips. Ireland's Prime Minister Leo Varadkar dropped a political bombshell today, announcing his sudden resignation. My reasons for stepping down are both personal and political. Varadkar made history in 2017 as the country's first openly gay leader and the youngest when he was just 38. He said his reasons for stepping down were personal and political, and he believes his party stands a better chance of re-election with a new leader at the helm. New developments in London tonight involving the Princess of Wales. British authorities confirmed today they are investigating after a report an employee at the London Clinic, the elite private hospital where she underwent abdominal surgery, was trying to access her medical records. CTV's Joy Malbin on the alleged security breach. Another day and another Princess Catherine headline. Now it's a police matter at the private London clinic where the princess underwent abdominal surgery in January and stayed for two weeks. Multiple sources are reporting staff members tried to access her medical records. The Information Commissioner's Office confirming we have received a breach report and are assessing the information provided. We're being told that three staff members are being investigated for trying to access the private notes of the Princess of Wales. They take any of these breaches very, very seriously. It's the latest twist in this royal saga made worse by that digitally doctored photo and wild conspiracies since she's been out of sight. Even this weekend video reportedly of Kate and Prince William out shopping has not stopped the speculation. And when you've got this real hunger for, to, to, to find out what's going on, then you will find people who are willing to try to satisfy that, that hunger by trying to access information that, that they really don't have any business looking at. Princess Catherine has reportedly been told of the breach, the fear of a leak of her most personal and private medical condition, yet another blow to the princess and the palace. We're not going to get the complete medical report or breakdown. And, and frankly, I think most sensible people would think, well, why should we? Yes, she's the Princess of Wales, but she's absolutely entitled to a degree of privacy around her private medical matters. The London private clinic pledging tonight to take all disciplinary action. It's a serious violation, says the British health minister, that could include fines and criminal prosecution. Joy Melvin, CTV News, Washington. Still ahead. We know that flavors are one of the primary reasons that young people start using these products and one of the main reasons that they keep using the products. Going up in smoke, the ban lighting up debate in New Zealand. A dangerous habit that has children hooked is sparking fresh fears, with Canada holding some of the highest vaping rates in the world. But now New Zealand has extinguished the sale of disposable e-cigarettes, or vapes, to minors. Here at home, the youth vaping crisis is still leaving a smoke-free future clouded. Here's CTV's Alison Bamford. In most cases, there's 20 milligrams per milliliter of nicotine in these, which is considerably high. A common concern raised in governments around the world. How do we keep e-cigarettes out of the hands of children? The biggest issue I've seen is actually parents buying these for their, their kids. Now New Zealand is setting the tone, announcing a total ban on disposable vapes and hefty fines for those who sell e-cigarette products to anyone under 18. We recognize that vaping got away on us 
and it became very attractive to the demographic we definitely don't want to start vaping and now we're left with, um, you know, how do we tighten that up? A move health experts and some Canadian vape shops would welcome here. They're a waste of money and they're horrible for the environment. It's the easy access and high appeal that have health experts worried. The potential for their long-term addiction uh, is highly concerning. Disposable e-cigarettes are legal in Canada, but a handful of provinces have banned flavored vaping products. The Canadian Lung Association has long asked for the federal government to follow suit. We know that flavors are one of the primary reasons that young people start using these products and one of the main reasons that they keep using the products after they start. Some vape shop owners believe a ban on flavored products could decimate businesses. In 2021, Health Canada proposed regulations to restrict flavors. They're still looking to advance these measures but have not provided a timeline. Alison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. After the break, the generational gap. So some of the younger adults in Canada and the United States are reporting lower levels of satisfaction with the support they get from friends and family, also higher levels of stress and anxiety. Boomer bliss while under 30s feel the blues. How happy are you? Well, some countries have a rosier view of the world than others. Canada, by comparison, has slipped in the rankings on the Global Joy Index and is grappling with a dip in spirits. CTV's Sarah Plowman on the generational divide. <laughs> There's no shortage of smiles in this toddler's world. And Dad is along for the ride. Being, being able to come out and play and have a good time and being with family. Tell the world that you're happy. Come on, buddy. Happiness summed up for one family. A global snapshot of happiness shows once again Scandinavian countries lead. Canada ranked as the 15th happiest country, two spots lower than last year. The United States fell to 23. In North America, boomers are happier than millennials in Generation Z. The report compared countries by age. Canadians 60 and up are the eighth happiest, but people under 30 ranked 58th. So some of the younger adults in Canada and the United States are reporting lower levels of satisfaction with the support they get from friends and family, also higher levels of stress and anxiety. Vance Foreman is just shy of 30. He's optimistic but faces financial challenges. Gasoline going up is obviously something that's kind of uh, weighing on my mind a little bit. Yeah. Um, buying a home also, um, I've been trying to save for what feels like ever. Those behind the report also blame social media. And how young people connect with each other and form their views about life uh, via the social media. A virtual connection researchers say is isolating. There is also the fact that many people from not exercising their social skills have now developed social anxiety. Back at the park, they're absorbed by a play day. A bright spot, despite the clouds. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. That kid could make anybody smile. And that's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.